Um, and um, it was all done with um, our hands and small hand tools. And um, while digging, we, uh, I'd found, uh, after about two weeks of digging, um, removing all of that dust that settled and that debris uh, was the first, um, the, anything that resembled anything that could be deciphered as modern technology. I found the, uh, the curly cord to a telephone was the first thing I found in digging. Um, and just continued with my hands in a little pick shovel, uh, filling in the buckets and passing them down the, the row. And um, the next thing I found was a, uh, a ream, of, a perfectly packaged ream of paper, um, untouched. That, I mean, all it was was just dusty and dirty. Um, and started, as I dug deeper, found a woman's sweater, found a victim's wallet. Um, I found an American flag that had survived. I found an intact dollar bill. Um, and uh, it, uh, it was difficult. It was tough. Um, it was very physically draining. Um, you know, we working 20 hour days with maybe three hours of sleep for weeks on end. Um, at some point I um, was down at ground zero and was taking a break. I could have been maybe three or four in the morning. I can't remember. But um, it had been some time since I had spoken to my family. Um, was sitting on the curb um, and a woman came by with uh, a milk crate filled with paper bags. And um, I, uh, she handed me one and I graciously accepted it. And it turned out to be um, uh, an apple, a, um, a package of breadsticks with uh, the cheese dip, a uh, granola bar, and a pack of chewing gum. And it was the first time I had eaten in maybe 12 hours. And so I sat there and I scarfed it all down and took a look at the packaging. And um, it was, um, you could tell that it was written by a, a, a young grammar school child because it was a crayon and it was the American flag. And it said, God bless America on one side. And when I turned it over, it was, um, it was from a student from the town that I lived in that had made it. It was from the same grammar school or grade school that my children went to. Um, and it was working in hell, um, having the, the pile in front of you and digging through the pile and smelling the odors that were, that were coming from it. The, the fires were still burning, um, smelling the decomposing bodies that were there, um, having all of this chaos around you, to have that little bright light of home, that home hadn't forgotten about me, that home found me and gave me the, the power and the strength to, uh, sorry, no, I, I, I understand. To, um, to keep doing my job. To, it, it reminded me of the reason why I first went down there to begin with, which was to <clears throat> to rescue, to help, to, to, um, to do some good and um, to get that reminder that, that there were people that were back there at home supporting everything that I was doing was, it was breathtaking. And um, it gave me the strength to keep going and um, continued. We realized and we came to the, the unfortunate um, point where it was no longer a rescue effort. It was strictly recovery. And... Um, we got to uh, remove a large amount of debris and, and uh, move a lot of stuff around and discovered that there was a crushed patrol car um, in the midst of where we were. Um, all along I'm working around what I thought was um, an air conditioning unit and it turned out to be the engine block of one of the fire trucks that was completely destroyed and demolished. Um, I was there when they recovered the door to um, 
engine 10, truck 10, which was the station house that was immediately across the street from the World Trade Center. They lost everyone from that firehouse, um, and their equipment was completely destroyed and unrecognizable, but yet here we were. We, I was standing right next to the guy that pulled the door, mangled as it was, pulled the door out, and that was all that was left of that fire truck. Um, having to go there and to see, you know, you, as you grow up as a kid, you're always told if you're ever in trouble, you find a fireman on a fire truck or you find a police car. And these are symbols of um, safety, for lack of a better term. You know, these are symbols of strength and, and everything that it is that we represent. To see these fire trucks crushed f on fire, ambulances crushed, and, and gutted by fire and police cars crushed, overturned um, like toys was a scene that I had never seen in my lifetime and nothing that a movie could recreate. Although I've seen movies that come pretty close, you know, like uh, uh, Earthquake and the like, you know, where you see that kind of destruction. But, you know, those were movies. Yeah, you yeah. never think that you're going to experience it you or see it. You say that's just Hollywood. That's Hollywood, but this wasn't. This was real life. This was for real. And here I am in the midst of all of this. Um, it was heart-wrenching because um, as a volunteer fireman, I know how important that fire truck is to us. It's our lifeline. Um, without the fire truck, we're useless. You know, it's where we keep our tools. It's where we seek refuge when we have, you know, when we are in trouble. And to have that symbol on fire and destroyed was de devastating. Man, what, when, when you were digging through this rubble and, and how, what, 20 hours a day yeah. you were doing this, what was going through your head? I got to find my brothers. I got to find my brothers that, um, that are unaccounted for. Um, I got to, I got to help bring them home. Just like the military has the term you know, we leave no man behind. Um, well, we have the same philosophy. We don't leave, we don't leave our brothers behind. And, um, and our brothers and sisters were there. And we needed to find them. And um, it was hard. I'm sure. Um, how did you get through it? What, what was your, uh, what was really driving you? Like, uh, I know that that bag that you know someone was watching, and the world was watching. It was watching uh, these first responders that were being, you know, these heroic deeds, you know, selflessness. Um, I, I'm at a loss for words as well. I mean, how did you keep going? I have no way of answering that. I it, I have no idea how I was able to do what I did. Um, Physically, you know, we're a very unique species when in times of need and in times of trouble, we are capable of doing just about anything. Short of having a president motivate you, in this case, President Kennedy motivating a nation, you know, in this decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. We didn't have the technology to do that, but we created the technology to be able to do that, to put a man on the moon to go where no one has ever been before, we are capable of just about doing anything we've set our minds to, which is the most precious gift of all that we have, is the ability to adapt and to overcome. And when this disaster took place, when this attack came to our doorstep, we in the first responder world stepped up to the plate because it was our time to you know, to take the gloves off and do what needed to get done, and at whatever cost. And um, a lot of guys are paying for it now. A lot of guys are suffering from, you know, uh, um, uh, health issues that they sustained from exposure to being down there for the periods of times that they were. But what motivated me was the fact that I had friends that I were unaccounted for. There were civilians that were there that needed to be found. Um, families needed to have the closure of knowing where their loved ones are or um, I had the support of my family, my town. Um, I had the support of strangers. Um, one of the hardest things for me to do was every day having to go in uh, to ground zero and having to come out at the end of my shift because there were 10, 15 deep 
of people cheering you on with signs of encouragement. And um, for me, it was very difficult because I felt as if I had failed in being able to bring the closure that they needed. But they were there to support us, to give us the strength to be able to continue our job. And that's how we made it through. Uh, in the dig, when you were still going through it, did, did you find anyone? Were you a part of uh, any of the teams that managed to rescue? I was there when, when some, um, and this is going to be rather graphic, but as the towers were coming down, they, they were pulverizing everything. And, and that cloud you saw was the compression um, and the pressures were enormous. Um, and it was pulverizing concrete. It was, it was literally turning it into powder instantly. People were vaporizing before your eyes. And these are accounts from first-hand or from colleagues that were able to survive the actual collapse that I work with who said that as, as they were being pelted with these objects coming falling from the sky, they're trying to get as many people away. And one of my buddies was, had told me that he, he was within as far apart as you and I were encouraging someone to keep up with him to run out and he turned his head away to look at someone else to encourage them and when he came back that individual was gone vaporized they, they just disappeared they vanished he has no idea how that happened you know as the cloud came and consumed uh, he was one he wound up getting struck from behind and um, uh, he fractured his leg so he literally wound up getting uh, crawling out of there um, and surviving that way um, but it was a matter of inches. Um, if you were to the left or to the right, or if you were an inch of, uh, in front of yourself or an, uh, an inch or two behind you, made the difference of whether or not you survived or you walked away with an injury or you didn't make it at all. Um, there was a story of uh, a buddy of mine from the 19th precinct. He was the sergeant, uh, the anti-crime sergeant. He was off duty. He was there tr um, visiting with some family and um, touring them around and he took them, he happened to be there. And um, uh, as the plane struck the building, he looked up and realized that there was some trouble and he sought, uh, the, if you take a look, there's uh, walkways that traverse the roadway and so he sought refuge under there um, only to wind up seeing the building starting to collapse and um, he had half a dozen to a dozen people surrounding him with no refuge, no place to go. And so he took his gun and he fired shots into the plate glass window to the atrium, which was on the far west side of where the World Trade Center was across the roadway. Um, he was able to shatter that plate glass window with his firearm. And um, he was responsible for saving those people's lives because they wound up seeking refuge underneath the uh, uh, escalator and that's what saved their life. Um, there was also the story of three transit cops that I know. Um, uh, they were in the train platform underground below the World Trade Center and their task was to uh, uh, send everyone out of the platform and seek refuge and they were the only ones that were left on the platform. These three officers were there and it was an abandoned station, um, but yet they felt the rush of air as if a train were about to come into the station. And um, they continued to feel this rush of air coming, and it was coming from the tunnel out towards the doorway that led into the lobby to the World Trade Center above them, like maybe two or three stories above. And it was, for them, it was a real difficult experience because they knew that the train system was down, but yet they're still feeling the same sensation as if a train is coming into the station. So they're all looking.